Hello, this is Professor Reardon for Computer Science 526 at the University of Calgary. This will be Lecture 15 on the topic of web security. So at this point, we're switching to the third and final major theme of this course, and that is considering um, browser security as well as security of online services and um, things that might try to interfere with the security when you're doing web browsing and all sorts of things related to that. So for now, we're done with the the network layer. We're done, in a sense, looking at uh, Wireshark dumps. And now we're moving on to thinking about more about JavaScript and other types of web programming languages. All right, the goal of web security is to make websites safe places to visit. That when people go on the internet and they use their web browser, that they are not vulnerable, that bad things can't happen. And this means protecting users' data um, because people are storing a lot of their sensitive information remotely on, on web services. So we want to ensure that that information is protected. We want people to be able to use the same computer to browse multiple websites at the same time in the same browser without having any weird complications or security vulnerabilities. We want that you can be logged into your bank on one tab of a browser and logged into some suspicious site or visiting some suspicious site on another browser um, without it leading to uh, bad security outcomes. We want to basically have complete isolation between the data that is stored on or used on one browser tab and that which is stored on another. And it turns out that that's not as simple as it would seem because there is a lot of remote and third party resources that are loaded when you go to a website. And then the question is, how do we protect information in one tab when it may very well be accessing information from other domains from third party locations that are unconnected to the to the website that you're visiting. And as well we want to support the development of secure web applications. So we want the it could be the case that you're having an online shopping store and here just the users providing input, the user's input may not be reliable and may be considered attack input. So now we want to protect your web application from doing things that you don't want it to actually do as a result of, for instance, code that you're running on the server side. And um, as well, um, a major important thing in the world of web security is the actual security of the traffic. And for that, we use TLS. So we have, in a sense, a solution there. But we'll see there are so still some issues that are arise, particularly usability issues as it deals with web security. So before we begin on that, we're going to just give some start nomenclature, just important concepts that we'll come back to. The first is a that of a URI, a uniform resource indicator. These this is a type of thing of which there are two main instantiations, URNs and URLs. So a URI is just a unique string meant to identify some resource. So this is a sort of abstract class, and it's implemented in two different ways. The uniform resource name, which is a type of URI that gives a unique name for an object. So for instance, I've given three examples here, and you can look them up and you'll see exactly what they are. They're specific things. So the first one, it's a URN, and the the next after the colon is the type of URN. In this case, it's an ISBN, or basically a book serial number. And then in the third field, you see there's a number that's the actual ISBN of a book. So this is a URN that is can be used to identify a book. So the URN the first, in a sense, argument to it is the type of URN it is. In this case, it's an ISBN URN. And then from that point, you have to understand, okay, how do ISBN URNs look like? And then once you know that, you can then parse the rest of the URN, which is the ISBN of the book. Um, our, as well, the Internet Engineering Task Force uh, has their own their own type of URN for all the RFCs. So if a specific RFC, in this case, RFC 2648, which... Uh, if I recall correctly, it defines what a UR, how our URN should look. It has a URN. So whenever you want to find or basically identify or communicate a specific thing, then 
that is can be done with these URNs. In this case, that RFC number is a specific RFC, it's not any other. The final one, Lex, so Latin for law, this is a law from the European Council, and it's basically stating how European Council laws will have their own URN. So it's a URN for the law that defines how URNs are going to be used uh, to uniquely identify European Council law. Now, URNs you may not have been familiar with, but URLs, uh, it's quite sure that you have seen these before. These are the things that you use when you actually want to go to a website. So a URL for instance, www.google.com, that's a URL. It's a uniform resource locator. So it's a different kind of URI. It's more common than URNs. And in this case, it not only identifies a resource, but it gives a sequence of instructions on how to get it. So it's not just uniquely identifying it like a law, like a specific law or a specific RFC or a specific book. It tells you instructions on where to go to actually access the resource. And this, this is why it's a locator. So it has a format, and the format consists of a schema followed by a colon, and then what I put in square brackets are optional parameters, so then optionally slash slash, optionally user at, uh, and then the host name, optionally a, a port if you're going to use a non-standard port, followed by the path with optional query, and then you can have a octothorpe symbol followed by a f any fragment that appears at the end. So this is the general format for all URLs. So if you think of HTTP colon slash slash www.google.com, there we're omitting the port, we're omitting a path, we only specify the host name and the schema of HTTP. However, if you are, for instance, logging in uh, to something with SSH, you may be used to having a user at, and if you're changing the port, you may also have that as well when you're identifying those resources. So you can access web, you can access HTTP on non-standard ports by basically providing the optional port parameter, and in this case, it would access it if not on on port 80, then whatever port you provide it. When you're using the standard ports, you don't have to do that. This is the benefit of, of having these sort of standard ports. We run HTTP on port 80, we run HTTPS on port 443, and therefore when we are using HTTPS colon slash slash, we're automatically connecting on port 443. And if otherwise, if we specify a specific port, then we'll use that one instead. So each schema has its own default port, and if the port matches this of the default for the schema, then we can omit it, otherwise we can provide it too. Next is a host or a domain. These mean the same thing. It is basically, we've talked about this in the concept of D D DNS, the DNS system that translates host names into IP addresses. So a host name is a series of one or more dot separated parts such as www.ucalgary.ca or just localhost, right? There it is, one dot separated part. So there's no dots as a result because there's nothing to separate. And it is organized in a hierarchical way from the right to the left. So at the rightmost, we have the top level domain, the com.ca.org and so forth. And then the second and third level domains are subordinate to their parents. So .ca is the top of the tree, then Calgary.ca, and then www server on Calgary.ca's uh, zone. And then you can keep adding more. So myserver.cs.ucalgary.ca. And in this case, the leftmost thing is the least coarse, uh, whereas the rightmost thing is the most coarse. So something else.cs.ucalgary.ca has a lot more to do with myserver.cs.ucalgary.ca than, for example, myserver.cs.ucalgary.ca and myserver.cs.ucalgary.com. Those could be in entirely different countries, for example. The next is the Hypertext Transfer Protocol, HTTP. This is used to actually request and return data. So we have get requests, we can post data, we have a head uh, command which it just returns the start of the data stream. And the most important thing to know about HTTP is that it is a stateless protocol. It is by design request response, you send a request, you get a response, and the protocol in this sense is finished. 
every interaction you have with HTTP is a completely new interaction. Every time you request a new resource, you're in effect starting from scratch and requesting, providing all of the information that you need to fulfill the request and getting all of the information back in the response. Now, this has had a significant impact on the design and impl implementation of applications on the web. And if we were to do a clean slate, perhaps it would actually look different. But as it is, we have this HTTP protocol as it exists, and this is what we use to serve nearly all of web traffic. And this HTTP protocol has this property of statelessness, which means that if we actually want to have a more sensible interaction, like logging into a website, adding something to a shopping cart, going to the checkout, things that aren't just one-off, send this data and, and get the response and you're done, but rather interacting in a rich and semantic way, we have to increase the um, the the features, we have to leverage the fact that the underlying HTTP protocol is in fact stateless and we have to add state on after the fact. We have to provide information that allows us to consider the the fact that we have an ongoing session uh, and tell the server that we're, we're continuing with this session that we have already started earlier, but the protocol itself doesn't provide that functionality. Just as an example, here's what an HTTP request can look like. First is the method, so get header post, followed by the file, so we're connecting to a host, and then this would be the path on the host, and you can see there's a question mark followed by arguments in a x equals y, amp uh, b equals a equals b, and so forth, so forth, followed by the version, so in this case, HTTP version 1.1, then a bunch of headers. Headers are colon separated uh, lines where it's a word hyphenated if necessary, a word, colon, space, and then the, the value. So host, colon, space, and then the value for the host. And the user agent, colon, space, and then the user agent for the client, and, um, and so on. Then there's a blank line, which is implemented with backslash r, backslash n, or carriage return and new line followed by the data. On a get request, there's no data. On a post request, there would then be data, and the length, the amount of data would appear somewhere in the request headers. So it would say content length, and then some number of octets, and that's the octets of the data that would be then following in the request. And then here is a response. For example, again, we have the version, we have the status. Status 200 means OK. Other statuses can be not found, 404 and not found, and so forth. So it's just the return code, so what the server says to us based about our request, and its headers as well. So the content encoding in the content type and the content length, here we see it's length 38. Again, after the headers, we have a blank line, and then the actual data. So in this case, it's a JSON object that stores the, some fields. All right, so the goal of web security is to allow us to safely browse the web. We want it that um, if we visit a malicious website, that it cannot, by virtue of us just happening to send our web browser to this website, it should not be able to steal information from us. It should not be able to modify how other sites look like when we then go on to other sites or change what other things we're looking at or in any way harm the user, any way cause the user to be harmed. And as well, we want to support having secure web applications. Ideally, the applications that would be served over the web should have the same security as local software. Right? We, we download software and we run it on our computers. In a very real sense, the web is the same thing. We go to a website that has, for instance, the implementation of uh, a full latex engine, like Overleaf, then we're not installing a full LaTeX engine on our machine, we're just using their implementation of one. And when we interact with it, we're downloading the entire application and running it. We're running this application inside our web browser. And ideally, we want these web applications to be as secure as though they were coming from and being downloaded and installed onto our computer. As well, we want security to be provided to the user even if they're visiting good and bad sites at the same time or regularly. 
we wanted that a user who goes to a website controlled by an adversary who is able to do whatever is within their power by virtue of controlling what the the user's web browser renders and runs on their computer cannot harm the user. That's that's the goal of web security. And this means even when they're run at the same time and they're run in separate windows, they're run in separate tabs within the same browser, um, or even if they are in an iframe, which is a used to have one website have an area where in it loads the content of another website, which is many legitimate reasons to do so and fundamental to the web. So even when there is an iframe, such as the evil site presents a good site inside, and it can even be that the evil site doesn't even show itself, it only shows the good site by having an iframe that's filling the screen, we want it still to be the case that if the user then starts interacting with the good site, they don't realize that they, or the evil site cannot learn anything about their interactions with it. That's the main goal of web security. And then another way of thinking about it is we don't want to have to have users have different computers every time they want to go to different websites. We want them to use their normal computer using the same web browser running all and be able to visit lots of different sites without having any negative effects or having the same effect of security as using, for instance, different web browsers or different computers to access different sites. So the web browser and web applications are the two sides of web security. So the web browser is what the client's running on their computer, and it's responsible for securely confining web content. So if you are going to an evil site and they iframe a good site and you type your password into it and log into the good site, the evil site shouldn't learn anything about it, even if it's iframing it, even if it's the sort of, in a sense, the outer web page that you're visiting. And similarly, we have, or on the other side, we have web applications. This is what's running on the server side. So the client runs the browser and the server runs the applications. And this can be any number of things. So it can be online merchants, banks and blogs, collaborative editing type things. And typically it runs a mix of server side and client side code. So the server side can run any number of web technologies, PHP, Ruby, active server pages, lots of different uh, web fra development frameworks that exist and they all have different niches and they can be running on the server side. On the client side, however, it's typically just JavaScript which is running. So JavaScript is the client side web scripting language. So servers can run whatever they want on the server because they, they're, they can, they're free to run arbitrary code. And on the browser side, it's just typically running some JavaScript. There are many potential bugs on the web application sides, and in the coming lectures, we'll talk about them all. So we have cross-site scripting, which is how you get one site to run code from, the, from another site. Cross-site request forgeries, which is how a, one site can make requests come from the user to another site and include information that, the, that they otherwise wouldn't have been able to get. And SQL injection attacks, which is where the client, in this case, attacks the server by providing it code, which it then runs. And, SQ and SQL is a specific kind of injection. In the general, it, we would just call code injection. And this is just, it doesn't need to be the specific SQL database language, but any type of code injection that can occur. And we'll see lots of examples of that. So in, in a... In a in a short form as well, the idea is that if we have an evil site, which is iframing a good site that you've logged into, that evil site that's on the outside should not be able to fake requests from you. It should, should not be able to issue requests to get information from the thing that it's iframing. Um, it has to actually come from you. It cannot come from the, the outer, the outer iframe. So visually here we have the, in user space, we have the browser, which is running on uh, an operating system, which is on top of some hardware. It's sending requests and replies to the internet, to some website, and the attacker can be everywhere. So the attacker can be on the network, uh, monitoring the communications. We've talked at already at great length about network attackers. We could have malware running on the, on the user's browser, on the user's computer. This is not outside the scope of this course. This is, would be more 525, CPSC 525, but that would be the, the malware attacker can exist there. And finally, the topic of the remaining lecture is the web attacker. That's where we're going to look at what, what evil sites can do or what uh, an evil client can do to attack a website. 
So a malware attacker can run malicious code on the victim's computer. They can exploit bugs and software. They can convince the users to install things that they shouldn't. They can masquerade as things that they aren't, like uh, you need to install this antivirus software to continue, or you have to install this video codec uh, in order to view this video that you want to view. There's Once you can get the user to install something, there's a good chance then uh, you're able to then uh, install malware on their computer unless they are taking cautions to not allow such things to occur. On the network side, we've had many examples of this throughout the course thus far, but we have passive attacks like eavesdropping of active attacks like poisoning the DNS or acting as an evil Wi-Fi router. So here, this is basically anything that Eve can do as Alice is trying to talk to Bob.com. And finally, now we have a web attacker. So this is an attacker who controls a malicious website, like attacker.com. They can have a nice SSL certificate, like they can use HTTPS, everything can look nice, they can show whatever content they want, but the point is that this website is controlled by the adversary. The adversary can put whatever they want on this website, and if the user goes there, then whatever is within the realm of the possible for the attacker can then be done. So we're going to explore what can an attacker do, what do we not want an attacker to be able to do, and how we can stop these things from happening. So how can a user visit attacker.com? Well, there are a number of ways. There could be a phishing email with a link and the user clicks this link and they, and they go to this website. Or there can be some clickbait or enticing content that gets placed there uh, on another website that the user is visiting and then they click on this link and end up on a, this malicious website. They could be just placed there by an ad network, so you're visiting one site and there's an ad for something and then you click on it and it takes you to the malicious website. And finally, you can just click by accident, or even intentionally because of an attack. These attacks we call click jacking, and we'll have an entire lecture on, on click jacking later. Uh, importantly, the web attacker has no other access to the user's machine. So they cannot control what software the user is running. They cannot in any other way uh, attack the, the victim's machine. The only interaction they have is by the content that they give to the user. That's their only interaction with the user is the website that they serve to the user. So we can talk about an iframe attacker. So an iframe is with malicious content included in an otherwise honest web page. So you have an honest web page that you go to and it has an iframe and that iframe loads malicious content. Right? This is another way that an attacker, a user could be in effect tricked into visiting attacker.com against their own volition. And how might this happen? Well, there's lots of times where iframes are used to load things that are not necessarily in the user's interest. There's lots of ads, there's lots of analytics, there's trackers that monitor users as they're using web browsers. So all of these things are loaded and can be loaded, for example, in an iframe. An ad is just an iframe that runs some other other code. So when you go to a news website and it loads an ad, that ad is coming not from the news website, but coming from some third party company that's providing that code. And they can provide image, but they can also provide JavaScript and, and analytics and trackers are examples of that. And so the main reason as a result to make use of an ad blocker is not because ads are annoying, but rather that they're running this arbitrary code. They're like loading anything that anyone who wants to serve an ad puts there. And there's no real opportunity to provide vetting for these unless you're willing to just say, we're not doing image ads, we'll just do text ads. So if we just have text ads, that's one thing. But if you're having ads that are interactive, that are, that are able to run code inside them, then it allows the attacker to put whatever code they want as long as it somehow gets put into an ad and, and someone is paid as a result of showing this ad to users. So a major way to stop all of this malicious, potentially malicious code from running is to simply not allow these ads and analytics scripts to be running on your browser when you're visiting web pages. You might think, but I never visit risky websites. Well, there was a study done and it was a simple trick that they that the, uh, they came up with. You put up a page with popular content, you get that into the search engines, and then once you're high enough 
in once they are indexed by the search engines for those keywords, you redirect it to an exploit site. So you put up a page that gets ranked popularly, and once it's popular, you make it now go to an attack website or where an attacker.com or something malicious. And it was this, at the time a study was done on this, it found that one percent of the top ten thousand pages were exactly this. Were actually a page that had popular content to get ranked high in the search engines, but which now redirect to an exploit. So let's talk about how the browser actually works. So the basic execute model of the browser is the following. Each browser window or frame, so in a sense, every tab that is open, and within the tab, if you have multiple iframes, and each of the iframes are doing this independently, it loads content. It renders the content to the screen, so it processes HTML, it processes CSS, it runs whatever scripts are, are necessary to figure out what, what data should actually go in, onto the screen. It loads the images, it loads subframes and subframes to subframes and so on. Once it's rendered, it then responds to events. And events are things like the user clicking on things, or when the user moves the mouse, or presses a keyboard button, or it may be based on rendering behavior, such as an event like when the when the the web frame is loaded, or when if an error occurs. And as well, events can be just timers elapsing. elapsing. So you can set a timer for every five seconds, run some script, and that maybe that script checks for updates to see if there's something new it should render onto that screen. The HTML itself, HTML is just a, a way of, of writing. So it's in the sense you're downloading this very long string and this string is encoded in such a way as we know it as HTML. But this is processed by the web browser and represented as a document object. And the document has properties, which are themselves objects, and this is all arranged into a hierarchical structure. So everything that exists in the HTML object, the, the title, the body, all of the content, all of the formatting tags, all of it is just somewhere inside this, this document object. And this is known as the document object model. So when you load a web page, you end up creating this giant tree that corresponds to the hierarchical structure of all of the HTML. And so if you've ever worked with HTML before, you might have created, for instance, anchor objects, so the A tag, that's how we do links. It, anchor objects have properties called, have an href or hyper reference property. So you can set the href to some value. In this case, it's these properties are, are essentially key value type things where the values may themselves be full objects on their own. So when you create, for instance, a bold tag, the, the B tag, the object inside the bold tag may be further another tag and another tag and then some text and, and, and so forth, or it may just simply be one string between that's being bolded. Either way, this can be the entirety of the HTML can be organized into this tree-like structure and correspond with, with each node of the tree having a bunch of properties um, which are, may themselves be further nodes in this, in this giant tree, uh, resulting in, with leaves in the end, which are the, the end of the tree where no further children exist. The browser then displays the HTML that it loaded onto a frame. And this can be the full window of a web browser. This can be a part of a window um, if it's being an iframed inside of something else. And this is represented by the window object. So we have a, a, a window.location property, and it has the URL itself that it's loaded as its properties. So when you want to change the location that a window is in, you can do it with JavaScript by just changing the window.location property. And now you, in effect, redirect. So that's how one website can load another website or change what website it's looking at. It's simply by changing the window.location property. So this document object is the root of everything. And it is standardized by the document object model, or DOM. And in a, a DOM is, in effect, just an API for JavaScript to manipulate 
anything inside. So JavaScript, the scripting language that is used for the web, it can change any aspect of the DOM for the object that it's that it's responsible for, the, that the object that it's in a sense working on. So when you download a website, it's originally delivered as this static object. This static HTML is then turned into a document object by processing the HTML and building this DOM, the do document object model, after which JavaScript can then interact with the DOM to manipulate anything inside. It can change the value of text strings, it can add new fields that weren't even there, it can add new content, it can remove content, it can hide things, it can change where you're even looking by, for instance, changing window.location equals evil.com. The, in a sense, the JavaScript is able to m mutate or any aspect of the, of the DOM that then is what the user actually sees. So what's downloaded at the beginning is just a initial version of this doc document, and then JavaScript then operates on it to change it however it wants to, uh, as, as the needs may be. So JavaScript is a language executed by the browser, and it's a scripting language, and scripts can be embedded into the websites. Into the, so when you download a web page, you get along with it a bunch of JavaScript code, and this code can be set to run at different times. It can be set to run before loading the HTML page or while viewing the page, or when leaving the page, it can run code when send a pop-up like, are you sure you want to leave or something like that, or when the user's interacting with the web page when they're clicking buttons or, or typing in text and so forth. This is when JavaScript can run, and JavaScript allows, in a sense, malicious web pages to execute code on your machine. You download this code that you have no reason to trust in the first place, and you run it. So if JavaScript could do anything on your computer, this would, of course, raise an enormous number of security concerns. So as a result, JavaScript is heavily sandboxed. It's not allowed to, for instance, open files on your computer and it's not allowed to open sockets and start connecting to various places on the internet without any uh, safeguards put in place to prevent abuse from occurring. The idea is that JavaScript has a limited interaction with what it can do. It interacts with the DOM, uh, so it changes what you see on the website, but it can't run on your computer because that would cause a huge number of security vulnerabilities that we would then have to worry about. Just for a brief historical component to JavaScript, so it was first created by Brendan Eich at Netscape. It was a scripting language for their Navigator 2, which was one of the early web browsers. It was later standardized at some point. Uh, the European Standards Agency decided that it was uh, it was time for uh, JavaScript to actually become uh, have an official standard. There had been so many changes and different versions and browsers supporting different variants of JavaScript at this point that the standard became quite complicated and, and cluttered, um, and it has since become more so as time has gone on. But nevertheless, JavaScript does appear everywhere and is wide, quite widely used and widely supported, so it can be useful to have experience programming with JavaScript. Note that it actually has nothing to do with Java. It was just part of a marketing deal. It's just Java was popular at this time for some reason, and so they decided that they would call this JavaScript to sort of ride on that or, or something along those lines. It did inspect the syntax and the semantics and the, the language itself. It really just has nothing more to do with Java than any other particular language. And as a language, it is multi-paradigm. So what are the main uses of JavaScript? Well, to have, in effect, all of the fanciness of Web 2.0, to have all of the things that allow websites to be active and immersive and do complicated things and be responsive instead of just being something you load and you're done. You load this and you view it and that's it. So it allows you to have special effects like changing images uh, or hiding elements or showing elements so you can make things appear and disappear. You can change what the cursor looks like. You can change content uh, dynamically so you can change whatever fields you, you want or change any aspect of the DOM. You can have form validation. 
So for instance, when you're entering in some data onto a form, it can check to make sure that you entered it incorrectly or that, for instance, the dates are correct, the data is in the right structure. Um, for instance, uh, I saw uh, one example of a form I was filling in. It asked for my credit card field. And in the credit card, I entered in my credit card number and it responded with the error saying that credit card numbers cannot have spaces, which is a design failure and possible security failures on multiple levels. So it's interesting to just think about this. In effect, some well, someone had to write code to manually validate the credit card field and in validating it, saw that there were spaces, which is a failure of least surprise because credit card numbers do in fact have spaces, and then report that this field cannot have spaces, so you you ha you can't. This is not a valid credit card number because there are spaces in it. Whereas the same code could have simply removed the spaces, so it's not actually achieving anything other than annoying the user. So it is a design failure in this regard. It's a least surprise failure because credit card numbers, in fact, do have spaces, and we'll see in a later lecture. It's also a possible input validation failure because you do not want to be doing any validation code on the client side, you want to be doing your validation code on the server side because the client can send packets, raw packets to you. So if you're relying on client run JavaScript to make sure that some value is going to not break your computer, then you are definitely doing it wrong. You need to be doing server side validation. And in this case, the server side validation simply could have just removed the spaces and checked to see that it is in fact a valid credit card number. Um, so JavaScript as well is used for all of the web apps. So anytime you're running something on your computer, that's more than just loading a website and then and reading it and then going to another website, but where the website actually changes, things like social media, things like collaborative editing, all of this is running JavaScript uh, on, the, on the client side. You can put JavaScript embedded in HTML as a script element. So then it's actually as part of the raw HTML code. You can say, for instance, script, open script, and then whatever appears in the middle becomes JavaScript. Or you can have a script field that just loads JavaScript from some remote file. So, or so for some, from some file, like for instance here, not malicious.js, JS the extension for JavaScript. This is then that whole script is loaded and then run as though it were copy pasted between two script elements. You can have it as a inside of a tag. So uh, anchor the a element. This can have the href equals something, and then it can even have event handlers as JavaScript on mouse over, for example, equals, and then the string that corresponds to the actual JavaScript that then runs when the on mouse over uh, event occurs. And it doesn't need to be the full code as well. You can just call a function, for example, like handle this on mouse over event. And then that handle this on mouse over event is then a full function somewhere else in your JavaScript um, that allows you to have more complicated behaviors if you want to fit it in nicely. And then you have a uh, as well a JavaScript schema. So just like we had HTTP colon, and we can have as well JavaScript is its own schema. And so now the href is not going to a website. It's not going to an HTTP website. It's going to a JavaScript. It's using the JavaScript schema to run JavaScript instead. And this brings us to the same origin policy, or SOP. The same origin policy is an access control philosophy that has is responsible for a great deal of web security. The idea of the same origin policy is that pieces of data, information that you load from a web server, is tagged with the place where you got it. And things you get from the same place are allowed to communicate amongst themselves. So if you get different resources from the same origin, these are considered, in a sense, grouped together and, not, uh, and, and interactions can occur between these items. Whereas uh, some information from another origin cannot, for instance, affect what the user is presented when they look at data from some uh, uh, another origin that is different. 
So, in a sense, this is an, a, a philosophy designed to protect uh, data that is somehow tied between the user's session with one website from being accessed by another website, possibly a malicious website. So that basically when you are using the same web browser to visit two different sites, there's no interactions between the elements of those different sites. However, if you load some resources from the same origin, then one page on the same origin can interact with the information the user is getting from uh, another another page on the same origin or within a frame on the same origin. Data can move around as long as it's coming from the same origin. So in a sense, you could imagine a script that produces a that tries to access the information that a user types into a text box inside of an iframe that is not on its actual website they will only be able to access this information if the iframed website has the same origin as the script that's trying to read that data so the idea of the same origin policy is that we want to avoid evil websites being able to manipulate the user experience for other websites. And as a result, the same origin policy is a compromise. It's a compromise between a more extreme form of security where you would say that no other website can touch anything related to any other website that they are not exactly equal to. That is, anytime you go to a website, all of the scripts and all of the files and all of the images and everything associated with it have to all be loaded in one big single HTML page, and there'd be no such things as having iframes at all in, in, such, a, in such a place. Um, but another is to allow this kind of third-party content allow different images to be loaded from different domains, allow scripts, allow iframes, allow um, re remote content that's loaded outside of the single HTML page you're getting, but to sandbox it. So the same origin policy sandboxes any content that's from another origin and treats it as though it were just a completely different tab open on the browser, as though it had nothing to do with the with the the uh, with the website that is responsible for having loaded that. And the main uh, security mechanism that SOP uses is the access to the DOM, that the document object model. So if a script is trying to change some elements of a DOM, and recall that if we modify the DOM, we're modifying what the user actually sees when they go to a website. If the, if the DOM can only be modified by scripts that have the same origin as the DOM itself, then we can have some, some measure more of confidence that if at least if the website is evil, it's going to be evil, all, all of it will be evil. And the only thing it can manipulate is the DOM of itself and not the DOM of other websites, which is the, the security goal of this policy. So anytime the DOM is attempted to be accessed, the Entity doing the access has an origin, and the DOM itself knows th its origin, and the, this check occurs to make sure that the entity modifying it has the same origin as the data that it's trying to modify or trying to access, or for, or for instance, the DOM includes input items of the user types into a text box, that text box is part of the DOM, and SOP controls being able to read from that element of the DOM. So all access to the document object model is controlled by checking the entity trying to access it, checking its origin, and relative to the origin of the elements within the DOM. So it works as follows. A base HTML document is assigned with an origin. And the origin is made up of a triple of scheme, host, and port. So HTTP colon slash slash www.google.com. And then we know that the port is optional. We If, it's, if the schema includes it, has a default. If the port is the same for the default for the schema, then we don't even bother to include it. So what I've highlighted here in red, these are the elements that are relevant to the same origin policy. So if the host name and the port and the schema all match, then the two elements are considered to have the same origin. 
and the rest of the path, so the slash something slash something else slash something dot HTML, these are all irrelevant to SOP model. It's only concerned with host, port, and schema, and typically the port is not even included. But if it is, then it is would be as uh, would be part of it. Otherwise, the default value is used. Uh, two origins are the same if the whole triple matches, and this is just based on string matching, so it's just checking to see if they're exactly equal. Meaning that if you have two hosts that effectively map to the same machine, they're just different uh, host names, but they actually go to the same machine, it will still be considered different origins. So you will have to have the exact same host name, even if you're ultimately connecting to the same IP address using different host names. If a host, if a port is not explicitly given and versus one that is explicitly given that still matches the schema, so for example, HTTP, if you have explicitly mentioned port 80 versus omitting port entirely, it varies depending on the implementation. So the specification there is not exact. So are they the same origin in this one sense? Yes. In another sense, well, if the port is explicitly mentioned, then no. And it turns out that different browsers interpret this differently. But this edge case is not typically quite necessary, quite uh, manifests not very often because the port is usually not provided explicitly, but instead the default one for the schema is used. An important point is that things that get loaded, like images and scripts, these get the origin of the entity that caused it to load. So the HTML document that's first retrieved has an origin. And that origin is then given to all of the scripts and images that are loaded by that HTML page, even if they come from different origins, even if they have different origins. That means that you can have a reusable, off-the-shelf style script that you can load from some third-party resource to do some particular useful thing without having to actually copy all of the code onto your server and serve it only from your server. You can actually remotely load scripts to do particular useful things and still allow it to access the DOM of the HTML page. And the reason for this is that we have in a sense, decided the author of the original origin to HTML document has decided to include these scripts. And the act of including these scripts means that they can now, um, they operate with that origin of the HTML document and can therefore modify work on that document and so on. Um, as well, it means that they cannot, for instance, change aspects of web pages related to the server that provided the script. So now the alternate world where they didn't inherit their origin from the document that loads them would allow a, a script that gets loaded to interact with the storage of the script, the server that stores the script, and control any web page that is related to its DOM. Instead, the script's origin becomes that of the document that caused it to load. So here we have an example from Wikipedia. We can see that the, uh, the website being visited, en.wikipedia.org, has a different origin from the image file upload.wikimedia.org. However, because it is loaded by the website, the origin of that image will be the same as the origin of the web page that caused it to load. And therefore, anything operating with that same origin can modify the image and read the read the bytes from the image or, or so forth. So the philosophy of SOP that one origin should not be able to access the resources of another origin. We trust we're from the same origin, we trust maybe it, the origin is a bad origin, but at least we mitigate the damage it can do by only allowing it to do things to itself, right? As opposed to allowing it to do interact across origins. So JavaScript on one page cannot read or modify pages from different origins. And importantly, the content of an iframe has the origin of the URL that serves the iframe, not the website that embeds it. And this is crucial because we, for security to work uh, in, in a general sense on the internet, we want to be able to have iframes where an evil website could in fact load a banking website 
fooling the user into thinking that this was just their banking website if the evil website sort of hides itself out of existence and just has a maximally sized iframe. But we want, even in such a case that the user is not able to accidentally reveal their password to the evil website, that the evil website cannot learn the keystrokes or the button press events that occur on items inside of the iframe that has a different origin. That is the iframe that would be of the bank's website. So this idea is, is, is the crucial part that gives the security properties that we want. We have an, one origin loading a full website in an iframe, and, and that full website has a totally different origin. So even though this iframe would exist within the document object model of the outer website, there is no access allowed, no programmatic access is allowed to any of the items inside that iframe of the other of the other origined website by scripts running in the outer one. Now there's a special case as well, as we mentioned JavaScript and the same with images, the JavaScript will run with the origin of the loading page, not with the, the site that it's actually served from. So here we have, again, an example, wikipedia.org, and there's a script silently existing, googleanalytics.com. This script has, of course, a different origin, but it runs with the same origin as Wikipedia, so it's able to get information about Wikipedia. Uh, it's able to access the DOM elements of the Wikipedia website, and Wikipedia would have given it permission to do that by including choosing to include that script. So a couple questions to make sure this is all clear. So here we have um, two different origins or two different uh, URLs and the question are, are they of the same origin? So I have three different examples here and uh, you feel free to um, ask questions on the forums if any of these are not clear. Oh, four different examples. All right, next topic is web cookies. The need for web cookies comes from the fact that HTTP is a stateless protocol, which we've discussed before. Each GET request or each HTTP request that is initiated by the client is concluded with the response from the server, and that's the end of that interaction. Now, this doesn't closely map to how most people use the web, and frequently we want the ability to maintain some state between the client and the server. So we have examples such as shopping carts or the concept of being logged into a website or that you might have a language preference uh, that should persist with every single page that you request. All of this represents some notion of having a state. And we want to be able to provide the state to the server so that they can return us with the website, the web page, in a sense, tailored for us at that particular moment in our interactions with that server, and not just a static website that is returned when you request some particular resource. So web cookies are the thing which add state. They add the ability to maintain a client side and a server side state. So a cookie is a file created by a website that's used to store information in the browser. So it's just a bunch of key value pairs that store the different, in a sense, values for different variables that a website wants the client to store. And then when you make a request, you include the, the cookie along with it. So your initial request, if you've never, for instance, made contact to the server, you won't have any, any cookie information. But however, the server can reply when, with his own HTTP header called set cookie. So set cookie can have a list of parameters and it's just a bunch of values of the form x equals y, semicolon y equals z, semicolon, and so forth, some number of these key value pairs. And as well, they don't need to have a value associated. It can just be 
for instance, test underscore cookie semicolon could be enough, and that would just mean, in a sense, set this value to true, or set it on, or simply know that this value exists. So arguments are optional, and uh, different key argument equals value, they are separated by semicolons, so you can have a bunch of different cookies set by the server when you are receiving any information. And a cookie as well can simply set a particular number or way of remembering who the client is at a particular point in time. So you can give a random unique identifier as the cookie, and then all further interactions will include this random number, and that has the consequence of reminding the server who you are and figuring out how how to continue servicing your your requests as you're making use of the server because now you have this cookie which identifies you to the server so cookies can have have a different same origin policy as as the document object models origin policy so it also has a notion of a same origin policy for cookies um, but it is manifested a little bit differently. They can be sent on any port. They can be sent using HTTP or HTTPS, so either uh, encrypted or non-encrypted, but they must have both the same domain and path. So a cookie for some host, google.com slash some then path such as a slash b slash c that now has a cookie associated with that domain and path and that cookie will be sent over http or https it can be sent on any port but it must be sent to the same domain and it'll only be sent if the path matches as well if, if you're within subdirectory so suppose you have a cookie for the root slash and you have the cookie for slash a slash b and then you're actually trying to retrieve slash a slash b slash c and you have no cookie for that then it is okay to use a cookie that is been established at a higher level so both the slash and the slash a slash b are eligible cookies for subdirectories however this does not work in the other direction. So if you have a cookie for slash a slash b slash c, you're unable to access it when sending a request for just slash. When when you're trying to send when you would send the cookie for the slash, you can only send the one in that matches the path exactly or some shorter path uh, but not a longer path. Now these parameters, these can all actually be tweaked. So cookies have some arguments that are in a sense meta arguments. They, they pertain just to the cookie itself and they are first secure. So if the secure argument is set, that means that HTTP is no longer allowed. All access to the cookie, all transmissions of the cookie that are sent over the network must be sent over a TLS secured communication channel it cannot be sent over HTTP. Another argument called HTTP only means that these cookies cannot uh, be accessed by JavaScript. That is that this cookie, the information stored within this cookie is only known by the, uh, only only known by the web browser. When the web browser goes to the website, it will send the information in the cookie. But any attempts by JavaScript via the DOM API to access the cookie, to read any information from the cookie, are denied if the cookie is set to be HTTP only. If the cookie is not set to be HTTP only, then there's full programmatic access through the DOM API to modify, change, amend, delete the cookie. But if it is HTTP only, then JavaScript cannot actually modify or read any elements of the cookie. As well, there's an expiration time that can be given. If it's omitted, then it means that the cookie expires as soon as the web browser is closed or as soon as the page is turned off, that it expires in a sense as soon as the session is done. However, if there is an expiration date set sometime in the future, it means that 
the cookie will be stored persistently by the web browser. So if you close your browser, turn off your computer, reboot, and turn it back and go back into the browser, that cookie will still be there and will be delivered to the server as, as necessary when you visit. As well, you can provide a domain argument to a web cookie. And by default, we have that a cookie can only be read by an exact domain. So for instance, myserver.cs.ucalgary.ca can only read cookies. The cookie will only be delivered when I'm accessing that exact host name. However, you could widen the domain and say, using this domain field to say .ucalgary.ca. That means that anything that ends in ucalgary.ca will now be given the information in this cookie. So whether or not this is secure depends on how an organization actually divides their domain host names and whether or not, for instance, something.ucalgary.ca might be in conflict with something else.ucalgary.ca. If it is the case that, for instance, one domain might want to have information, might want to learn cookies that are being stored for another domain still within the .ucalgary.ca namespace, then there might be an actual threat. There might be some risks. The university has different faculties, and the different faculties might not share all of the information that, uh, that or be treated, in a sense, as separate entities. So just because they have the same, um, more or less the same host name, does not mean that necessarily all of the information they'd want on one being stored on one for one server could be sent over to another. So by default, the domain has to exactly match. But in cases where that's not very useful, you're allowed to widen it. And as we know, these host names are fine grained on the left and more coarse on the right. This widening works by providing a suffix of the domain, and that's now the suffix that has to match exactly. As well, another field is the path. You can say path equals value. And this is similar to the domain idea. It widens the path of who may read the cookie. So as we said before, by default, only the current directory and any subdirectories can get access to this cookie data. But through the path equals value, we're able to re reduce or remove this restriction and then allow entities higher up on the path to access data stored in this cookie. So what are the main uses of cookies? Well, first we have this notion of a session ID, which is just a random number that the cookie stores sends to the server every time it does any interactions with the server. And this allows the servers to index all of the client states by these session IDs. It just stores a big table mapping session ID to the actual state that it needs to store in order to perform its duties as a web server, whatever it's trying to provide, whatever service it's trying to provide to the client. And whenever a client makes a request, it simply looks up the state by using the session ID as, a, as a, in a sense, a hash table index that allows it to find the correlated state. Another use is authentication. So the idea here is that we take the cookie, we have this random session ID, and this acts as an authenticator. If you think back to the way Kerberos had this notion of authenticators, we first authenticated, and then once we authenticated, we have this ticket that allows us to have access to things. Well, the idea of a, a session ID for a cookie is that if it is a truly random number and we protect it, we, for instance, have it's set to secure and HTTP only so that no, uh, it cannot be accessed by any other entity other than a web browser that stores it. Well, if no one else knows what this cookie's value actually is, then no one else can prov provide this value. No one else can provide this value to the server. And that means that not only is the We're this, we're, we, we're, we want to continue doing an HTTP request for some particular session, we're able to say, 
and we are the same person who earlier logged in with a password or something like this when you gave us this random value because only the user who knows this number would be able to present this number if it was sufficiently large and truly random. And this, as a result, makes the notion of cookie theft which uh, particular concern because it turns out that using random numbers for cookie or for authentication for web browsers is how everything works is how all of the sites that you have to log into but then afterwards you don't have to continue logging in or typing your password every time you're on one screen to do anything because recall HTTP is stateless so the fact that you don't have to enter your password on every single screen means that this sort of cookie based authentication is occurring behind the scenes and what happens is that if someone else knew this number this this number corresponded to your cookie they would be able to impersonate you and the server would have no 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 reason to not believe it's you because they're under the impression that the only way to know this number is to actually be the person who was told by the server what this number is cookies also allow for personalization so you can store settings from previous visits you can set a language preference you can turn off some things or can make some configurations without for instance having to have an account it can just remember preferences without actually tying it to a, a storing that on the server here this client just stores it and says by the way i want this website and provides the cookie which may have a bunch of arguments like in language please set to english or something like that Cookies are also heavily used to do tracking. They allow users, as they interact with different sites on a particular website, they're able to provide the cookies along with it. So then a persistent identifier, some random number that identifies the user, would be able to also be used to just recognize the same non-logged in individual over time. When you're going to different websites on the same server, it'll see, ah, it's the same users who's requesting it as they're going along, even if you're not actually logged in or something like that. As well, there's a notion of third-party cookies. Here, what happens is that, uh, let's say, a website A.com has an iframe for B.com contained within it. B.com sends back a cookie. The user stores this cookie for B.com. And then whenever the user goes again to A.com, B.com gets informed. So B.com gets informed about the user's visit because the user will continue to send the same cookie that B.com set. And this is called the third-party cookie simply because A and B have different origins. So now it's a cookie that's being provided by a third party, not the actual website you're visiting, and being used to track the users as they're using different websites. So imagine Facebook, you may go to a bunch of different websites and Facebook may have a third party cookie embedded in there so that Facebook gets informed every time you're visiting these different websites. Um, even though you're not actually, for instance, visiting Facebook at all. And so if you are find that unacceptable, most web browsers have the option to disable third-party cookies for exactly this reason, because there's a number of privacy risks uh, and abuses associated with third-party cookies. So it's typically a fine idea to disable third-party cookies entirely, and it's rare that you'd notice any change in the way the web works.